Hi, thanks, thanks for having me everyone. Um, I'm Phil from Archeal to Scotland, I'm the Adopt a Monument project manager um, and I just thought we'd have a quick run through over the last 30 years. Um, I've been in post since 2009, so not quite half of the uh, duration, but it's amazing the project's been running for so long. So just a quick, quickly, a quick touch on what Archaeology Scotland, who we are. We've been established for over 75 years um, and we work with communities and schools and all sorts of audiences to promote and care for Scotland's archaeology. Uh, as you can see, we run, and you probably already know, know this, but we run a, quite a few projects like Adopt a Monument Attainment for a, Attainment Through Archaeology, New Audience Project, Heritage Heroes Award, Scottish Archaeology Month and Discovery and Excavation Scotland amongst others. Um, so what is Adopt a Monument? Adopt a Monument is basically community archaeology but it's archaeology by communities and rather than you know the traditional kind of ex excavation uh, those kinds of things it's a conservation project at heart. So the project deals with the conservation of archaeological sites, it deals with promotion, it deals with interpretation and, it, and what we do is support communities to do all of that. So we provide training, provide archaeological support, we help with fundraising, all those kinds of things. So where did it all begin? And I just should say, I, I sort of stole this image off um, our director, Elon McQueen, he used this a few years ago, so about the, setting the, the theme of what it was like in 1990 when this project was first being discussed. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, a slightly different world, but you know, some things have just not changed. And the first project was um, started to be delivered in 1991 by uh, Peter Yeoman as part of a pilot project for Adopt a Monument, a Carden Tower over in Fife, um, which then opened um, a year later in 1992. There were a bunch of other projects, um, and there was quite a large concentration in Argyle, as it turned out, in the early 90s, which would repeat itself in the um, early 2010s, strangely. And yeah, so just the, the very the history of the early days is quite simple. It's quite straightforward. There's a consultation. The first project was run uh, by Peter, as I said, um, and then there was a, a group of other projects, at least one a year, but another two, three each year. And if you go, if you're out in Argyll, if you go by Brimport Bay or Adnadam, you'll still see they're up and running and uh, great places to visit. And then there was a little bit of a lull. Um, it turned out that the actual su providing support for these projects and delivering them was actually quite time consuming. And the CSA, Council for Scottish Archaeology, as we were at the time, didn't have the resources to support it all that much. So there was, a, there was some support continued until the late 1990s, and then it was slowly dropped. But what happened next was Ollie Owen at Historic Environment Scotland suggested that we look at starting the project again and um, our director Elon McQueen took that on board. We, there was a report commissioned, a consultation and funnily enough I was at CFA Archaeology at the time when they looked into some of the um, findings of the early adopt um, and I remember, I remember commenting on the, some parts of the report that um, Mail at CFA pulled together. So it's, quite, it's quite funny but then Eventually, the uh, funding was found for a member of staff, and the project was relaunched. And Helen Bradley came into post in 2006, and over the next three years, delivered 12 projects. As you can see from the map, they are quite widely spread out. Uh, we've kind of moved from the Argyle base, although there's still a couple um, in that region. And again, there's some lovely projects. If you think of the uh, in Dundee at Balgarth, no stone circle. It's a stone circle that was. Um, Basically, it was it had issues with um, antisocial behaviour. People were setting fire to the standing stones and firing fireworks at them, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, the, the groups cleaned the cleaned the site up. They erected a fence, the in new interpretation, a wildflower meadow. And since then, the park has been re-landscaped to reflect a kind of more Bronze Agey feel. And uh, is used now as a family. Uh, a place where families go and the zoo visit every year. It's quite nice. And there's, there's a few of those projects that are still like that. And others like Coldingham and Ascent, um, Bressa, who went on to be 
bigger projects in their own right and they're still going strong in various guises. Um, and then you get to me. I was, um, I was appointed on a nine month contract initially to look at the funding for the future of Adopt a Monument, um, which is what I did. We, and we eventually received historic environment funding from Historic Environment Scotland and the National Lottery as it was at the time to work over five years to increase the scale of the project and to diversify the audiences in some way. So we looked at um, you know, the kinds of things we could do with heritage and you, just looking at some of the pictures there tells a story. We've got um, the group of people looking over the sea at Arden American, looking at our, um, the project they're doing there, but also looking over at a project where we delivered on Mull. Um, Hair Hope Care and the notice board I just have to thank Trevor Cowie for how he supported me in the early days and was a great advocate for the project. And on the bottom right there was uh, us out at Torwood Rock, which again, a huge support from Matt Ritchie at Forestry and Land um, over the years. So we've been very lucky and the project we had to, we had to come up with a group of projects that were ready to go and convince the funder that there was demand without having any resources to del actually deliver these projects if the funding fell through. So I was incredibly lucky that groups like um, Kildevy on Mull and Ballasgate on Mull and other places were uh, able to work with me on that and yeah, we managed to get it off the ground. And, and what this is what we delivered over those five years. And I'll go into some of that in a little bit. Um, just the type sites, sites that were, were adopted over that period. You can see there's a lot of graveyards. Um, people are very keen on graveyards. The cairns are quite popular too. Um, but a lot of the projects turned into wider landscape studies in actual fact, which is very nice. And as I said, what does a project do? Conservation of field work. Provides support around those issues really. Uh, so these these projects here show that in in some ways we we worked with this is again the top top left is a people survey and field survey and site recording up in Ardnamurk and top right we worked with the Accord project at the Glasgow School of Arts to do some 3D um, recording at the necropolis in Glasgow the bottom left is Haley's Cairn in Largs uh, with vegetation management um, and some other issues which are ongoing actually there was some recent vandalism um, at the site of the Cairn and, and we've just been out working with the council to try and resolve some of those. And bottom right is the, um, the old Kirk in Kilhoen, which, is, which we helped uh, repair the lintels above the doorways to make the site accessible again as it just become a little bit unsafe. And just to give you a, nice, a, a more detailed example of how that actually worked in practice, one project, Cairn Glass up in the Highlands, on the Black Isle is a chambered cairn. It um, had been excavated previously, but there, were there was debris in the chamber, in the burial chamber, and one of the stones had fallen over. So we had permission from Historic Environment Scotland to reinstate that stone, um, make the site presentable. We, put the, we replaced the boundary fence, we installed some interpretation. And it's a nice, really nice example of how the project worked in practice. A site looks better, is conserved, stabilised and um, promoted to the public. What else did we do? We, we looked at partnerships and employability. As I said before, we worked with Forestry and Land, we worked with East uh, Renfrewshire Council on the Rook and Glen project, we worked with Scottish Canals, we worked with um, Forestry and Land, I've said that. We, <laughs> we worked with um, yeah, we worked with a number of partners where we could deliver projects that would help support their their heritage strategies and or programs. Dunfermline Council is another good example where we worked with their parks programs uh, on various things. And that spawned um, a few kind of side projects in the, if you want to call them that, Canal College is a good example, set up by Scottish Waterways Trust and Scottish Canals, um, later taken over by Keep Scotland Beautiful. Uh, we supported young people on a 14-week program where they learned um, transferable skills, employment, employability, they learned um, about archaeology, they learned about um, traditional skills and they learned about um, natural heritage um, 
and we for each of those programs, each of the 36 programs that were delivered, we delivered three weeks of archaeology, whether that was excavation or survey, etc. Fantastic programs, and the initial evaluation: 70% of the young people went on to employment or training. Um, they've just finished their last program, and um, hopefully they'll have similar numbers for the rest of that. And one of the outcomes of that for us is at, with the Doctor Monument in Archaeology Scotland is that led to our own attainment through archaeology program, which we're currently delivering um, across Scotland. And what else? We also tried something new, or at least for us, um, we engagement projects, outreach projects, as we were called at the time. We worked with Women's Aid in the Highlands, Crisis in Edinburgh, Bernardo's in Falkirk, lots of charities like that where we could support their users to have a bit of respite, learn something new, get involved in archaeology, and whilst at the same time, you know, expanding our audience, learning more about how we can support different people. Um, to engage with their their own past, it's their past after all. An example, a good example of that is playing the past in Glasgow, where we, uh, or Glasgow and Edinburgh, where we investigated two football stadiums, Cathkin Park in Glasgow and St Bernard's at um, George V Park in Edinburgh. Uh, uh, yeah, and just engagement projects where we use the the kind of hook of the sport to get more people involved, and that in turn spawned. Uh, the new audience project, which has just been, is just on, is ongoing currently, and we've just completed some work over at Hamden um, Bowling Club in Glasgow. And again, this is about supporting marginalised groups or new audiences, um, just to spread the um, our engagement and see see what we can support people to do. There's a bigger concern around well-being, health, and skills um, in a wider society, and we think that we can support that through our projects. Um, and as I said, we just completed some some work there at Hamden Bowling Club looking for the very first international football stadium at, um, yeah, in Glasgow and, well, in the world. But And we had 11, people from 11 different countries on site, a lot of local partners involved. We found some nice archeology span and it was, it was a great project for just in, inclusivity and, um, bringing people together and we hope to do more. And then developments were about around Adopt a Monument itself. As I said, we the Cairn Glass project is a great example of how projects can work and be successful. But there's also other other things that come up from time to time. Our long standing work in Arden American meant that we had a great relationship with the community and we were able to work with them to address their own develop community development plan and some of the issues that arose in there around you know people learning about their heritage, creating more opportunities for tourists and for visitors, uh, those kinds of things. And so we, with funding from the ERDF through Nature Scott, um, the Natural Cultural Heritage Fund, we were able to start a kind of slightly larger project where we'll deliver 10 adopter monuments on Ardmerkin itself over the next two years. Um, the Rewa West. And as I said, so we're looking at delivering 10 sites there, adopter monument sites in the traditional sense, but also to look at heritage hubs, at, um, trails, training camps, reconstructions, um, and economic development. We, we've been going at this properly for about six months now, um, and we'll We'll see how we get on with that. Some of those, these things are aspirational at this stage, but we're very confident that the partnership we have with the, the Ardmerk and History and Heritage Association and the local community groups is um, is really strong. So I, we're really hopeful that we'll produce something really nice by the end of July 2023. And just to give you like some background, I just thought it'd be useful just to say that at Sordal, Bay was on the north coast of Ardnamurk and we'd been working up there for 16 years, I think it is, now, um, with an academic um, project that based out of Le the University of Leicester and the University of Manchester, the Ardnamurk and Transitions Project, and we were able to support that project through engagement with the schools, conservation of the site, uh, the chambered cairn there and, um, and other things. And it was that kind of, it was the community, it was through that link of working with the different 
elements of the community, the school, the voluntary groups, the community council that we were able, the estate, the Ardenmokan estates, that we were able to um, use that as the basis for the Real World West project. Which brings us on to what they're doing now. Um, and this is a little bit of a, a, a detour for us in some ways. It was the, the jetty in Kilhoan it's still in use, still used for um, mooring boats and fishing. There's a, a fisherman who uses it, um, but it was in a state of bad repair. But it is the historical jetty for the township of Kilhoan and it has historical significance, um, at least locally. And so it's hugely important, but, it, but it's also a current active site. Uh, and there's not many of those in the documentary program, it, uh, it turns out. So what happened is the, the the jetty was in a serious state of decay over the winter. Um, the local community tried several times to employ contractors to help repair the site, but were unable to get um, to get a reasonable contractor in. Not in the sense that it was either too small a job for some contractors or too big for others. So they really struggled. So what they did is they pooled their their skills and. Um, they formed a group which they called themselves the Boys from the Jetty, <laughs> and they and they worked basically over the last lockdown. So between March and um, sorry, between January and March last year, they worked on this um, repairing the jetty, trying to get it ready for the tourist season. And uh, there's lots of stories about friendship and um, proving that you know being outside during lockdown and and meeting new people and all that sort of stuff that comes from this project, which is fantastic. But the actual repair of the jetty is also fantastic. Um, and it's been used incredibly well over the, the summer months. Uh, you, what you can see there, they've, they've installed a time capsule. The kayak club is now using the, spent the, the space to expand their storage um, and other things. And if you were there over the summer like we were, the, there were people swimming off it, fishing off it. There were lots of boats mooring up. Apparently, it's on some. They've seen been added to some websites so people are sailing from slightly further afield to land at the new jetty, which has brought new trade to the shop and the pub and all those kinds of things. So it's a it's really good example of a, a new project that came out of this program, trying to address this kind of slightly wider issues, conservation on one hand, but then how it impacts the community on the other. Yeah, so just in summary, really, um, we've completed 115 Adopt Monument projects over the last 30 years, delivered 25 engagement or outreach projects, 10 partnership programs, um, there's two international Adopt Monuments, one in Ireland and one in Finland, which have in, the, in turn have spawned um, other programs, so there's, there's now in, in Finland, instead of just being in Tampere, it's also in Helsinki. Um, and I think there's talk about it going north. Mm. We discussed projects in with Finland and in Bo Finland, I've said Finland, Norway and Bosnia. Um, so you know, there's a, the models being used elsewhere is really nice. We've supported 42 employable, employability programs, 36 at Canal College, and um, six others. And as I say. We, I like to think of it as the, the Adopt family now, although, you know, there's a wider Archaeology Scotland stuff, the new audience project, ATA and the Rio West, and we've raised over £2 million for these projects. Um, but we're still going. Uh, we have, we're not, it's not just in Arden American that we're delivering stuff, we have projects in at Temple in Midlothian, Ayton in the Borders, uh, oh my God, I'm going to get in trouble now. Uh, there's lots of sites. <laughs> um, we, we're currently delivering, I think, th including the five in Arden American for this year, we're currently delivering 13 projects this year, um, which is brilliant. The demand is as high as it's ever been. I think part of that is part because of people want to go out and do something nice because of co the lockdowns ended. But also, I think groups are just really interested in heritage, which is very, very nice. So, yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. I should just thank the funders, particularly Historical Environment Scotland, all the staff that have been involved over the years, and most importantly, is all the participants. Thank you very much.